there's something to this that if we tweak it a little bit, okay, because maybe they don't have the whole picture, they, they can come up with great new ways and encourage them to come up with new ideas. Say one of your employees comes up with an idea. What is the process from when he gets that idea, whether it be in the shower, over the weekend, whenever, to seeing if it makes sense for the company? Take us through that process. We, we have them call something called hotline. Okay. okay, anybody has an idea, they put it on the top of the page, hotline. It's a big red thing, okay, and it comes right up the line. It doesn't, doesn't go through the layers, okay. It goes right up to the, the management and innovative, okay. And hotline is then looked at. Okay, and then once a month, okay, or so, we sit down and say, hey, here's an idea. And if the idea, we don't understand it fully, we'll say, Jim, I'm going to fly you in, okay, to talk about your, your idea. Okay. And nobody ever says, well, you can't do that, you dumb something or other kind of thing. Let's think about it, okay. What could we do to make this idea, and is the idea enough to put the time and the effort into it? The reason why Sobe, believe it or not, was so successful for such a period of time until it was finally sold was it stayed under the radar screen. People said, ah, who, nobody goes into healthy. It looks like a fad kind of thing. It's not worth the big companies to go into it. That's how you get to be successful. You find things that the big guy, because of their structure and layers, can't get to and do it. I remember one person saying to me in the oil and gas, they'd come up with an idea and they started their own company. They did that because they could get that idea into production in three or four months, whereas the big company would take two years to, to do it. Mm. It's true all around. The small company, lean and mean, that works fast and effectively can outdo the dinosaurs. Every day in a week. Right, but you talk about a small company that's lean and mean. You've taken a company with a few employees to one with many employees now. How does that, and that's one, of, as you know, one of the hardest things for entrepreneurs to transition mm -hmm. from a sole, a sole proprietorship uh, to one with many employees. I'm fortunate. I know I can't run companies. So therefore, I turn the running of the company over to other people who know how to run it. As long as they know that we're not going to be inundated with meetings and forms, et cetera, kind of thing. Right? So it, it is. It, it's the toughest thing in the world because an entrepreneur is great because he can think outside the box and he can move, et cetera. When he's starting to run companies and do things, that's when they get washed out and, and, and go down. So I'm, I, I realize that. And because I realize that we keep on jumping and doing things, we get other competent people in to run the operations, okay? And then m motivate them by saying, hey, okay, what's your goals and objectives? If you do that, if you can accomplish it, then you should be compensated for it, okay? And then in my businesses, we say, hey, do you want stock or cash? Mm -hmm. At certain stages, you have to have cash. You have kids and what have you. Other points, you say, you know what, I'll take some combination or I'll just take stock. Okay, then I'll really push it around and, and, and do things. So that, that's where that works out. And then the continually saying, okay, we're doing this now. Is there anybody else? Give me a, give me a better example, okay? Uh, our dog food cafe company, Blue Buffalo, has right now 72 different SKUs, 72 different products. We have no research and development. Now, how can you have 72 products when you have no research and development? Because we go around to everybody else and say, hey, what are they doing? Okay. Right. And, and, not only, and we don't stop there. Okay. We were going, we were doing one of our shifts and we, we, we stopped at McDonald's and somebody ordered a bacon cheese and something. Why not bring that and have a dog food that's called bacon cheese? So I think if you're crazy, if you really enjoy what you're doing, if so, I mean, for Sobe, when we first started, okay. We were taking the Sobe things and pasting these labels on other trucks, on tow booths. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we didn't know what we couldn't do. Let me give you another example. They're talking about in innovative. Let's take the first day that Sobe got an opportunity to present at one of these shows. And, of course, when you do that first time, you're way in the back, okay, the worst booth in the world kind of thing. They won't let you advertise. How do you get people to go from the front all the way to the, the back? To, to yours, okay? Well, we went out and got an old bus, we painted it, Sobe, et cetera, kind of thing, delivered all our stuff to the fair, and unfortunately, Jim, we got flat tires. And that darn tr bus had to sit outside in the front until we could get it fixed, 
okay? And we kept on handing out stuff, you know, if, if, as you walk by, you know, if, if you see our booth, that you can redeem this for, here's a hat, and et cetera, et cetera. Now, you can't do that in a book, right? No. Yeah. <laughs> but you mentioned something, and I'd like to point it out, about open innovation. You know, going around, you don't have any R&D. A lot of companies these days are looking outside their walls for new products, new ideas, and then bringing them, in, them in-house. Yes. And you've been doing that all along yeah. uh, and being very successful at it. And the people are your greatest source for doing it. Because if you let people, if you ask ideas of people, they really know how to do things. When we acquire companies, we, for, for the, the, the New York Stock Exchange companies, New York Stock Exchange companies, and Vail, we acquire a lot of companies. Okay. Unfortunately, or fortunately, our way of doing things is to say if management was, was, was losing money, we get rid of manager, top management. Mm -hmm. Then we bring in the second layer, and we say a second layer, how should things be done? Jim, it's amazing. 90% of the time they say, it's the first time anyone's ever asked us how to, no. how to do it. I, mean, I remember going back to school when they did the Johnsonville sausage case. Okay, and the question was, how do you get... These people on the, on the floor don't know anything about yeah, the president said, you know what, we're going to let them figure out how to lay out the place, let them give us ideas on new products, et cetera. No, they're just workers. Johnsonville Sausage went from here to here. It was one of the greatest cases I had at Harvard, and one I've continually used over and over and over again. It and that was a family business, and family you business. have a family business. Oh, yeah. But there's, there's different oh, dynamics going oh, on in family geez, businesses. It really, really is kind of thing. That, the, 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 everywhere else, it's that profit, profit, profit motive. And with a family business, it's quality of the product. Our name is connected with it. And who are we going to pass it on to next? And does that have to be a family member or not? And how does that change things? And how do you motivate a family member who may think, gee whiz, I'm entitled to be president. I'm entitled to make a million because my name is the same as the name. So it's completely different. That's the hardest way to innovate and change because it's, I mean, I remember coming home from Harvard from, from, from my dad's family business. And I said to him, Dad, you've been in business since 1865, this business. But I have these new ideas about orders and fancy things. And he said, you know what? We've been in business since 1865, selling the same thing over and over. It's worked for this generation. Why don't you think it's going to work for our generation? Because like, that, it's changing times kind of thing. It's very hard. Well, how is that then? You, you're the son or daughter of the founder, and I know you have uh, some of your kids in the business. How do you manage change if you're not the founder? It's easy for you to manage it or lead it however you like, but for some of the kids who might not be, um, well, I guess, not confident enough or uh, may not know how to approach the task. And, and it's tough. There's a big shadow for the guy who was the founding or somebody who was really successful to have to follow that kind of thing. So I think I have been innovative, and it's worked tremendously. Mm -hmm. it, it's very interesting. I asked my kids which of the then 10 or 12 companies that they want to run or be involved with, and they said none of the above. So I said, okay, come up with an idea of a company that you want to run. Show me how it can fit under our umbrella. And now they're coming into the existing 12 or 13 right. companies, but at, at a different level. They've had a chance to prove to me that they're good, right. and, and they've had some experience doing things. And now the other people who are working with them the, view them differently, Jim. Right. Instead of just being the green, they're, hey, so-and-so has, has done a nice job with what they're doing. They're, they have some ideas for what we're doing. And let me understand this better. If they have an idea and that idea doesn't go anywhere. At least they know that they've been heard, correct? It goes through a process, That's just correct. like any other idea. That's so correct. they won't feel upset if it doesn't go anywhere. That's correct. They are judged exactly the same as every other idea. My advisory board, Jim, and I really suggest that anyone that has family business have an advisory board and not be their accountant or their lawyer or their banker. In my case, these are all successful people who know nothing about any of the business that I'm in, but can ask the right questions sure. and motivate the people. And that's the same thing that happens when we bring the entrepreneurs into the classroom. Okay? They, the, the students have the opportunity to ask questions of people who you know, have done things. And you mentioned earlier about failure and not to penalize uh, uh, any employees too harshly. Can you speak to that maybe and uh, give an example? To me, you learn more from 
failures than you do from successes. The question is, how do you view failures? Is failure a failure or is failure an opportunity to look at something